been saddened to learn of the passing of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, last Friday morning. The Business Committee has agreed as a mark of respect to adjourn today's sitting after members have had an opportunity to pay their respects. This requires a formal item of business as listed on the order paper, which I will now take. It is a business motion and there will be no debate. Clerk, please read the motion. That Standing Order 20 brackets 1 be suspended for the 12th of April 2021. Before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that this motion requires cross-community support. And the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. Sorry, I did not ask Robbie Butler to move the motion. <laughs> Retrospectively. So move, Mr. Speaker. Okay. So all those in favour say aye. 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 Can't really know. The ayes have it. The ayes from all sides of the chamber and there are no dissenting voices. I am satisfied that cross-community support has been demonstrated. The motion is agreed. We will now commence uh, with today's single item of business, uh, which are tributes to the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. And as I mentioned at the start of this sitting, all business originally scheduled for today has been deferred so that members can pay tribute to Prince Philip and to extend our condolences to the Queen and the Royal Family. Under normal circumstances, I would be inviting members to sign a book of condolence. However, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has been requested by the Royal Household that there should be no physical books of condolence at this time. An online book of condolence has been set up on the Royal website and members who wish to send a personal message will find a link on the online book of condolence on the Assembly website. And I wish to, first of all, thank uh, all parties for their cooperation with myself and the Speaker's Office and officials on Friday afternoon to ensure that we had arrangements in place for the Assembly to pay our proper respects. I want to say a few words myself about His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, who passed away last Friday morning. A while on couple of fuckle, a raf, we in Prince Philip, a fair boss and Shackman Shock Hedge. It is of course impossible to do justice to such a long and full life within a few short minutes. But it is worth reflecting that even for those of us in the older generation in this assembly, Prince Philip's lifetime of public duty had already begun before we were actually even born. Now, that is a record of public service with which few will ever be able to compare. Much has been said about the multitude of experiences, achievements and interests of Prince Philip's life, particularly in earlier years, and I am sure members will reflect that during our tributes this morning, including his 56 local visits. Therefore, I will just touch on a number of elements briefly in my own remarks. Members will know that it is a personal priority for myself as Speaker and other members of this House to have a youth assembly established as a way of empowering young people and providing them with experiences and opportunities. In many ways, the Duke of Edinburgh's awards scheme has been doing that for some 55 years. It has become a household name to the extent that many people may not appreciate the massive reach of that programme across the world. The 27 organisations who deliver the programme locally cover every aspect of our society, including churches, uniformed organisations such as the Boys Brigade, the Girls Brigade and Scouts, the Army Cadet Force Association, Gaelic Athletic Association and Fela and Fobel. The Duke of Edinburgh Awards did not just bear his name uh, as Prince Philip clearly took an active personal interest in the programme right up to very recent years. For example, he was instrumental in establishing the partnership between the programme and Geiske, Gradam and Uchteron, the Irish President's Award, to allow participants to the choice of which certificate they would receive for their endeavours. His priority was on opening the door for young people to participate, whatever their background, and the ability of the Duke of Edinburgh Award to reach disadvantaged young people is particularly to be admired. Of course, that is typical of the very significant role in recent years played by senior members of the royal family, which they have played in reconciliation efforts in our society and in these islands over the years, and it is right that we record our appreciation for that today. From all of the accounts and tributes that have been paid over the weekend from across the globe, it is clear that the Duke of Edinburgh was a significant historic figure, not just within the UK itself, but internationally. It is true that throughout the 99 years of his life, we have all been on such a journey of change and tumult, 
challenges and opportunity, both domestically within these islands and globally. And of course, there will be many other days to reflect and to dwell upon all of that. At this time, we remember that a family has lost a husband, a father, a grandfather, and a great grandfather. In particular, none of us can appreciate the sense of loss that there must be after 73 years of marriage, love and steadfast support through an extraordinary life. There can be no truer example of the, le- the term life partner. Therefore, on behalf of this Assembly, I express our sincere condolences to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and the wider royal family, and I hope that they will take comfort from the warmth of the reaction since the news of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh's passing. Souvenir Siri Er, may he rest in peace. The Business Committee has agreed to allow an, around an hour and a half for tributes and as, as is customary. I will first invite party leaders or their nominated representative to speak for about five minutes. I will then call other members who have indicated they wish to speak or who rise in their places. And I don't intend to impose strict time constraints, but I would encourage members to take no more than three minutes allocated to give time for as many members as possible in the time allocated for tributes. And I now call Mrs Arling Foster. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, The life of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, was shaped by history, uh, consciously and unconsciously. Uh, The ramifications, disruptions and consequences of the First World War resulted in his family's exile from Greece. And in his childhood, he was effectively alone and taken under the care of the Mountbatten family, um, most principally Lord Mountbatten, someone who he was robbed of, of course, later in life uh, by a pirate bomb. Such momentous momentous disruptions could could easily have left this young child to withdraw from life, but each burden was borne on his young shoulders. And as he came of age, the world entered its second war. He joined the fight against fascism and put into practice the values that he would exemplify for the rest of his life. Duty, loyalty and service. He served with uh, the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean, the North Sea, the Far East, even being present at the Japanese surrender. And after the war, romance blossomed with his life partner, Queen Elizabeth. Her bedrock, as they served us, our country and our Commonwealth. And all of this was carried with dedication, humanity and humour. A sometimes blunt humour, Mr Speaker, which we got to appreciate here on his many occasions when he visited Northern Ireland. In this era, too many too readily pour scorn over the traditional values which he exemplified. When you see what his values achieved throughout his life, you see how traditional values can shape a better world. He showed, of course, that you can believe in the best of tradition and the inevitability of change at the same time. He redefined the role of a royal, working with hundreds of different causes and organisations, with younger people, service and driving British innovation at the centre of his efforts. His work with the World Wildlife Fund was literally decades ahead of his time, and over two million young people have gained a Duke of Edinburgh's award. Proudly, Northern Ireland boasts the highest participation levels in the award scheme in the United Kingdom. So a true intergenerational legacy to our youth, our United Kingdom and the world's environment. Yet, as we remembered our much-loved monarch, and her family in our prayers. Our nation's deepest gratitude is for what His Royal Highness did on the 2nd of June, 1953, and every day until his death. When Her Majesty was crowned in Westminster Abbey, Prince Philip pledged to, quote, become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship, and faith and truth I will bear unto you to live and die against all manner of folks, so help me God. He fulfilled his pledge, he kept his word, and we are all the better for it, that he, and that is our common debt to him. His Royal Highness, Mr Speaker, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, has truly had a life well lived to the full. And in closing, Mr Speaker, can I say that I do welcome the respectful way in which you 
and the parties have responded to the passing of His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. I think the unity of spirit has been evident. So let us all harness and channel that spirit moving ahead as the Assembly and Executive work through the very real and significant challenges that face us. Because the Duke of Edinburgh demonstrated the desire for a better future, and particularly so for our younger generation. So let us embrace his legacy to positive effect as we all go about the job of seeing Northern Ireland reaching its full potential in the new century ahead of us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Michelle O'Neill. Gormi, I've got a can call you, and can I um, start today by extending my sincere condolences to Queen Elizabeth and to her family on the death of her husband, Prince Philip. Over the past two decades, there have been significant interventions by the British royal family to assist in the building of relationships between Britain and of Ireland. It's appropriate that this contribution to the advancement of peace and reconciliation is rightly recognised. I have acknowledged the sense of loss which will be felt within our community and across these islands by those of a, of a unionist tradition and a British identity, those who value and those who cherish the royal family. Given Prince Philip's long service of duty to the monarchy, a tapestry of memories remain for the British people which over these last number of days since his passing have been shared through the media. During the course of this decade, from 2012 to 2022, we are marking the centenaries of seminal events which have shaped modern Irish history over the past century. These events have defined our relationship over the past 100 years too. It's a relationship which has been characterised by colonialism, partition and political division, but towards peace, reconciliation and renewed cooperation. I was reflecting over the weekend on events, recalling that in 2012, the late Martin McGuinness, as a leader of republicanism, met with Queen Elizabeth and with Prince Philip in Belfast which marked a very important step on our journey to reconciliation on this island and between our islands. Then in 2014, the state visit to Britain by, Pre by the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, occurred. And that was the first state visit of a President of Ireland to Britain. As part of that, Martin McGuinness and I travelled to London's Royal Albert Hall to take part in the Kaleroo, the celebration concert, where we met with Queen Elizabeth and with Prince Philip. Since those important and historic moments, the political landscape has changed and Brexit has unfolded over the past five years, which has tested British-Irish relations, its implications for both islands far-reaching. I hope that we can overcome these challenges with the efforts of us all, and not least the two governments working closer together, something which I believe is undoubtedly required at this moment. Saturday past marked the 23rd anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, and despite the challenges along the way, there is no denying that huge progress has been made over this time. And while we have an imperfect peace, a work in progress, if you like, the agreement has provided an alternative to conflict. I acknowledge that the Queen and Prince Philip and their family were directly impacted by the conflict and regrettably endured sorrow and pain as a result of their personal loss and their bereavement. Each of us present here know that the tragedies of the past have left a deep and profoundly regrettable legacy of suffering for so many families across society, of which we are still trying to confront and to address. Yet having endured such personal loss, the royal family set about working towards advancing peace and reconciliation, and I have been witness to these efforts and their example of leadership myself in recent years. As the Queen and Prince Philip did so, we in this chamber, 23 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, must redouble our own efforts, efforts to achieve reconciliation as we forge a path together, giving a new generation of young people hope and opportunity that a brighter future exists. Thank you. And I call Nicola Mullen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As Deputy Leader of the SDLP, can I begin by expressing my sincere condolences and those of our party to Queen Elizabeth and her family on the loss of a loved husband, father, grandfather and great-grandfather. My thoughts are particularly with the Queen, who has lost her husband of 73 years. To wake up without your steadfast compa companion of that length of time must be heartbreaking and for many of us is unimaginable. 
This is an immensely difficult time for them all, compounded by the restrictions which have made saying goodbye so difficult for families and people across our islands. I also send my sincere condolences to people in communities across Northern Ireland who feel a special connection and affinity with Prince Philip and the royal family. This is a sorrowful time and our thoughts are with you. It is a feature of commemorating significant or historic, fe historic figures that we often reduce them down to their best or, depending on your perspective, their worst features. It is especially easy in the age of 280 characters to simplify the contribution of a lifetime to a quick turn of phrase. It is fair and important to say that the uncharitable and mean-spirited online commentary by some about Prince Philip in particular diminishes us all. I don't intend to reflect on his life's history. I leave that for others to discuss. Save to say that Prince Philip was a complex individual, shaped by loss in early childhood, who refused to be pigeonholed or placed in a box. While across this house we hold different views on monarchy, his was a life of public service to a family that he clearly cherished and people who held him in the highest regard. In 2014, while I was Lord Mayor of Belfast, I was able to welcome the Queen and Prince Philip to Belfast and host them for lunch in City Hall. While my interaction then with Prince Philip was brief, this occasion was friendly, it was warm and it was very memorable. Mr. Speaker, the people of these islands are joined together by our common history and shared experiences of historic conflict. It would be remiss of us to fail to acknowledge that Prince Philip and his family were deeply affected by the conflict on this island and between these islands. We should also reflect on the role that he played alongside Queen Elizabeth in building relationships, setting aside enmity and promoting reconciliation most visibly during the recent visit to Ireland. He had a part to play in sustaining the new bond of shared endeavour across these islands. This will be a difficult week for many in our community. It is important that we all respect that and that we continue to work together to heal the divisions of our past and build a more united community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Steve Egan. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. And may I join in the tributes today to His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. I would also, at the onset, wish to send my and our party's condolences to Her Majesty the Queen and the other members of the royal family. We all share in Her Majesty's grief and her sense of loss. For her husband, who was her constant companion, supporter and muse, for 73 years of being together through momentous times of change, that sense of loss must be profound. The grief and mourning that she and the rest of the royal family are feeling is echoed by many, not just here across our nation, but across the Commonwealth and beyond. From the many thousands of young people who found a new sense and purpose to the Duke of Edinburgh's scheme, to those who welcomed his keen interest in science, technology and education, his long commitment to the environment and his early championing of the crisis of climate change, and a support to the families of all of the many who have served across all aspects of public life, a support to which that he brought his own unique, witty and emphatic style. Rarely has someone who has never sought the limelight but decided to solely sacrifice himself for duty, for support and for stability of the institution that he and we most treasure. He has garnered so much respect and affection. While I feel that sense of loss, indeed the sense that we are indeed a passing of an era, I would also wish to thank the recognition of that loss made by, in particular, the Deputy First Minister, and members of the SDLP. May I state how welcome your remarks were, and whilst we may disagree on much, those are welcome sentiments. I appreciate your sympathy and reaching out 
to those of us who hold the Union and the monarchy dear. Thank you. I had the privilege to meet Prince Philip on many occasions, both during my service in the Royal Navy and later in my role supporting the British-Irish business environment. His humour has been much and frequently remarked on, remarked on, although it was in the naval environment in which he felt fully at home. His anecdotes there were very much more of the salty kind. But what he did have was a respect for what many tried to achieve in very difficult circumstances. He used his wealth of experience to understand. As someone who fought with extinction in the Second World War and saw the global winds of change at first hand in what is now the Commonwealth, he brought insight and support to Her Majesty through the good and sometimes not so good times. Indeed, as a great friend to Northern Ireland, I know he was saddened by the horrors of the Troubles, and he only wished for peace. The murder of Lord Mountbatten had a profound effect, but he never allowed animus against those who committed so much violence from whatever quarters to prevent him from reaching out to support the peace process. I had the privilege of seeing it firsthand during the Irish State President's visit to the United Kingdom in 2014 how much pleasure he saw in the improving relationships amongst, across these islands and amongst our nations. But as the man himself, he leaves the most abiding memory. At the 100th anniversary of the submarine service in Westminster Abbey, he spent his time talking to the families of those who were serving at sea, those who had been away for months, and he never forgot to thank them for their service and their sacrifice. He put them at ease, he reminisced and gave them comfort, often with a wry but always with an affectionate sense of humour. He was always, at his core, a Royal Navy officer who never forgot the lore of the sea and those who served on it. On Friday, we lost in many ways an unsung inspiration and the biggest supporter to Her Majesty. His loss to her and to all of us is most keenly felt. Our nation mourns, but from his life and his example gives us hope for the future of, your, of our United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. And may I finally say, in the words of the Royal Navy hymn, Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm has bound the restless wave, may you, Prince Philip, rest in peace. Thank you. And can we now bring Naomi Long on screen, please? Can you invite Naomi Thank Long you. to make your remarks? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to extend my thoughts and prayers and those of the Alliance Party to the Royal Family at this very sad time. My condolences in particular go to Her Majesty the Queen, who has lost her husband and constant companion and support of over 73 years. No matter your role or how public your life is, that is a devastating thing to experience. The Duke of Edinburgh lived a remarkable life. After years of distinguished service in the Royal Navy, including in wartime, he left behind his naval career, which he loved and in which he excelled, to support the Queen when she became monarch. He became the longest serving royal consort in British history, leaving four children, eight grandchildren and ten great-grandchildren. Throughout that time, whether by her side or the customary two steps behind, he demonstrated in practice what it means to be a supportive husband to a powerful woman. Speaking on their golden wedding anniversary, the Queen said of Prince Philip, he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family and this and many other countries owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. Because of course, His Royal Highness Prince Philip, as the first Royal Consort since the days of Prince Albert and Queen Victoria, had to carve out a role for himself in the life of the country and the royal family and the Commonwealth, something which he did successfully over the last 73 years. He was a reformer and moderniser of the royal household, much in the way Prince Albert had been in his day, as he encouraged more informality and less protocol in engagements, and also promoted the use of new technology, particularly television, as a way to let people have greater insight into the life and work of the family, but also as a way to encourage industry to flourish. His work spanned his patronage of many charities at home and abroad. 
His passion and concern for the environment and for conservation was evident long before such things were part of the popular discourse. His, com his commitment to the World Wildlife Fund was unstinting. As its first UK president from its foundation in 1961 to 1982, then as president of the World Wildlife Fund International from 1981 to 1996, and continuing as president emeritus and patron until his passing on Friday. Vitally, his commitment to supporting young people build their resilience, skills and confidence, and also crucially their commitment to public service, led to the founding of the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. That scheme and associated schemes such as the President's Award in Ireland, which has encouraged millions of young people from over 140 countries across the globe to work to improve themselves and their communities, is perhaps his best and most enduring legacy. Prince Philip's was a long life, well lived. I pray that the 73 years and years of happy memories and that life well lived will be able to bring some comfort to Her Majesty the Queen and to the wider family circle and all those who loved him in the difficult days and months ahead. Thank you. And I call Rachel Woods. Mr Speaker, and I too would like to extend my condolences and those um, to the royal family on the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. There have been many, many stories and anecdotes about the death um, of Prince Philip since Friday, many of which have been shared in this chamber and on the media. And I wasn't aware of the adversity that he'd faced in his younger life, and I was really interested to learn that he'd described himself as a refugee after his family were exiled from Greece when he was an infant. From a child refugee to the Queen's consort and a member of the royals, it got me thinking um, about the way that P Prince Philip was, and perhaps his passing should be a reminder to challenge the negative perceptions of people that we have. The Duke of Edinburgh was a father to four children, eight grandchildren and ten great-grandchildren, and I'm of the age that I'll remember him as an older man and think of him in his role as a grandfather, but also a uh, man who had the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, of which I had to traipse up and down the morns a number of times with a backpack, uh, with many fond memories of meeting new and interesting people in my community and, and giving back through the Duke of Edinburgh uh, scheme that I did as, as a bronze, silver, and uh, got halfway through gold. Um, so I'll remember him for that. Um, but who can forget the images of him walking along beside William and Harry at the funeral of their mother? The relationship between a grandparent and grandchildren can be so precious, and he will be dearly missed by his grandchildren, particularly those that grew up with him being there. And many of us too miss our grandparents at this time, and our families that we can't hug or visit them inside. The houses and the Duke's passing reminds us to appreciate and treasure our grandparents and families when we can. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Claire Soglin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, I want to also thank you for your kind and respectful co comments at the outset. As someone who will always consider herself British as well as Irish, it's much appreciated. On behalf of East London Derry, I wish to offer my condolences to Her Majesty the Queen, the Royal Family, the United Kingdom, and all those who knew and loved His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Prince Philip visited my constituency many times, and probably in his final visits to the area, I had the pleasure of meeting him. Indeed, he was the first royal that I had met in this role. He was interested, he gave his time, and he was witty. And I am delighted to say that I have my own story of his wonderful sense of humor. As a very fresh 27-year-old MLA in 2014, he questioned my life experience to be an elected representative. Um, and I wish I was just as quick in responding to him, but I stood there with my mouth open. So I suppose in some ways he was right. But seven years later, with more experience and more life, um, I reflect on Prince Philip's work throughout his 99 years. And I do not think any of us, even if we are as fortunate to live as long as he did, will ever have the life experience that he had, because his life was truly remarkable. Since learning of the Duke's death, I have been most affected by the end of the partnership of the Queen and her Prince. Theirs really is the greatest partnership in British history, a love story that lasted a lifetime and inspired generations. And I am so sad for Her Majesty. 
He was her hero. He was her man. And what a man he was. He sacrificed so much to serve his queen, love his wife unconditionally, and fulfill his duty to country and commonwealth. While he was physically two steps behind, he was never two steps behind because he was his own man and he carved his own path, in particular in relation to young people. He invested so much in young people and given the difficult weekend past, given the images that we saw across Northern Ireland, we can learn from his example of investing in young people, not just giving them schemes and jobs, but actually understanding and listening to what interests them and how we can provide opportunities. I watched a documentary at the weekend and really was so impressed by his duty to service and people. And he said, if I can make life more to tolerable for those who come after me, then I'd be delighted. And wherever he is, I'm sure he is delighted because he had a life well lived. Since his passing on Friday, there has uh, been a number of quotes and the one that has stuck by me and others have said is uh, by the Queen. And she described him sim quite simply, he was her strength and stay all these years. I know some don't understand my um, appreciation and affection for the royal family. And those words are simply uh, what it means for me. They are a strength and stay for me all these years. They have been part of my life. And I recognize that Prince Philip was also part of that. And may he rest in peace. He will be sorely missed. I call Jim Allister. Mr. Speaker, as with any death, whether from lowly or high estate, uh, our first thoughts um, are quite properly with the immediate family. And so my condolences, that of my party, uh, first and foremost, go to our Queen, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, to whom, as consort, Prince Philip was such a rock and such a support for so many years. And then, too, of course, to his grieving family, his children, and their children, and all in that wider family. They will all grieve as we do when we lose one so close. There will be no difference to their grief. They will feel the same emptiness, the same pain, the same suffering. And now, after 73 years, of married life, Her Majesty must face her public and private life without her rock. There will be difficult, tough days for the Queen in all of that, particularly for someone themselves in advanced years. And I do pray that she finds the strength to carry on in the remarkable era that has been her rule over us. But today we also celebrate a remarkable and incredible life of service to country and to people. From his service in the armed forces, then to his decades of service as concert and his dedication to that cause and to the people it served. And filtering down right to the very, uh, throughout our society, through the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, which empowered and reached so many. Everything else apart, that is a lasting legacy of particular note. And yet he was a man, though in that elevated position, refused to allow the position that he held to mould him. Despite his exalted position, his willingness to speak his mind 
brought a stamp of authenticity and sometimes indeed a smile to our faces. And that is a characteristic that very often is lost in public life, but not with the Duke of uh, Edinburgh. And of course, he was not immune from pain and suffering in his life. Indeed, something that marks an affinity with so many in this province was the brutal murder of his uncle, a 79-year-old, blown to bits by the IRA with other relatives and friends. A wicked act of the calibre that left so many in this province also bereft of friends and relatives at the hands of terrorism. And today would have been a good day for the Republican movement to unequivocally say sorry. But of course the Deputy First Minister doesn't do sorry. At most, all the Sinn Féin can muster is what the journalist Jenny McCartney aptly described as the carefully calibrated mixture of dogged justification and fuzzy regret. But today we remember a great, a giant in our lifetimes, whose contribution to our national life has been immense, but whose life, which inevitably, in the mortality that denotes us all, has run its course. Our nation and our people are the richer for his living. And so today, on behalf of my constituents, on behalf of my party, I join in mourning his passing. And in grateful memory of the life of His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, I convey the deepest sympathy to Her Majesty and record thankfulness for the lifetime of service and devotion to our monarch, to our nation, and to our people. Thank you. I call Evan Poots. Speaker, and as a representative for the constituency most visited uh, by Her Majesty the Queen and her late husband, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, can I express my sympathies to Her Majesty um, on the death of her dear husband um, from uh, the people of Lagan Valley. Um, their home in Hillsborough Castle uh, is a place uh, which uh, they visited so many times over the years, and it was certainly um, a, a brought them very close to the hearts of the people in, in that uh, community. The Duke of Edinburgh was a very special character, and I had the privilege of meeting him uh, a number of times along with Her Majesty, and uh, whether it be at uh, Downshire uh, Primary School or, or the, the Lagan Valley Island, and latterly um, at the South West Hospital, uh, where the Queen opened that facility. And he was known for his toughness and his resilience, and the royal family had many ups and downs over the years, and they have been uh, well documented. And he's been a rock uh, in that. But he's also known uh, for his sharp mind, uh, for his wittiness, uh, for his incision, and sometimes that got him into trouble, so his quips could become gaffes, and the media loved to play upon that. And um, as someone who, who does that occasionally myself, I, I can really appreciate. Uh, the, the quandary that he finds himself in, because um, you, 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 want, you want to um, engage with people and you want to lighten an atmosphere, and sometimes it just doesn't work right. Uh, uh, and the, the, the Duke, uh, on his visit to the South West Hospital, 
Um, he, he, he remarked to me uh, that he thought he'd come to open a hospital, but instead he'd come to open a hotel, uh, given the quality of, of the building. And that was just him. He, he liked to, to, to make a witty remark, and he liked to, to, to lighten the atmosphere. I think that the example of Her Majesty and himself as a, as a couple and the love and devotion that they have had for each other over those 73 years has been quite remarkable. It's an example to us all. He has shown how he can reach out and, you know, some people perceive their royalty. What would they know about working class? His example where he reached out through the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, uh, which was really aimed at helping young people um, find a path in life, or find a path out of those difficult circumstances that many of them um, had found themselves in, uh, is something that will last long, long uh, beyond his passing. He has laid down a great example uh, for us all in terms of hard work, in terms of honesty, in terms of reaching out, uh, in terms of loyalty. And I think that we all do well um, to reflect upon that. I think one thing um, that we can't let go um, today is the effort that Her Majesty and uh, the Duke of Edinburgh made in terms of reconciliation. Um, their visit to um, Ireland in 2012 and subsequently the President's visit um, to Windsor Castle in 2014 um, uh, it was something which was of huge significance, um, the efforts that were made there. And, you know, he didn't allow um, the death of his uncle, the cruel death of his uncle, um, not to reach out the hand of friendship. And there is a lot for all of us to learn from that. And if there's anything that this house can do well to reflect upon, it is how um, he and, and, and Her Majesty um, sought to heal wounds. And over the course of the last couple of weeks, we have seen um, how things can go wrong in this country. And we could all do well to learn uh, from Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh on how we can heal wounds, not open sores, and how we can make things better, not worse. Thank you. And I call Pat Catney. Oh, yeah, Mr. Speaker, I rise to give my condolences to Queen Elizabeth and to her family, who is grieving the loss of a husband, a father, a grandfather and a great-grandfather. For anyone to suffer a loss during these times, when families cannot come together to support each other in the grieving process, is something that many in our community have had to go through. It is not something that you would want to wish on anyone. This comes down to common decency of humanity, where we like to comfort those in this situation by talking about 99 years being a good innings, a life well lived, and that is all anyone could hope for. But in 99 years, you build up a huge community of human connections, of lives touched on a people who have lost a pillar of their own lives. For those who Prince Philip has been a constant companion over his long life, the sense of loss and deeply felt. This is no more so for someone like Prince Philip who devoted life to public service, who made his presence felt across the world and devoted himself to the development of our young people with his Duke of Edinburgh Awards. My own mother passed away just a year ago or before her 94th birthday. She was the one constant in my life, whose wisdom and courage was something I was able to rely on for as long as I have had my memories. We all have family members who are no longer with us, and we all continue to grieve for them. As I say, I speak out of a common sense of human decency. It is something we have been completely lacking in here over the last few weeks. 23 years ago, after the Good Friday Agreement, we have entrenched ourselves in the old nonsense, talking about points and stereotypes of the past. I am a nationalist and no supporter of the monarchy. 
But from an early age, I went to the Moor Memorial every Remembrance Sunday in Moira, in the, where the, the Prince's house when he came to visit Northern Ireland and that constituency. My uncle Lawrence is on the memorial, who died on a ship bringing munitions to South Africa. What I am trying to say is that this false dichotomy of Protestant or Catholic, Unionist or Nationalist, us or them, has always been false. We are not one side of the other. Our personal histories are intertwined, connected and eternally bound in the one community that we are all trying to survive in. In recent months, I've been struck by the conversation I have had with loyalists and Republican ex-prisoners because they have both told me the exact same thing. They have said that the old us and them politics does not speak to their beliefs or their needs. It does not speak to the young men in their communities who are dying every day from suicide. It does not speak to the lack of educational standards that prevents their communities from prospering and developing. It does not speak to the overbearing deprivation that leads the young people in their communities to feel like there is no future except for the old ways of the past. When I was elected in Lagan Valley, I was asked what it was like to be the only nationalist elected to Lagan Valley. I spoke of the need to represent and work for the one community of Lagan Valley to help face and tackle the issues that we all feel, regardless of background. Mr Speaker, this is more true today than ever. We have listened rightly to all sides of this chamber, expressed condolences in unison. Now let's move forward together and do the job our community so desperately needs to us all. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, I was very fortunate to uh, have met His Royal Highness uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, on, on two occasions. Uh, the first occasion was in 92, maybe 93. Uh, it was in my previous employment. Uh, I was a young sergeant at the time. I was working at the Northern Ireland Training Advisory Team, training um, major and minor units to come to Northern Ireland to, to deal with the, the issues that, that we had here. And I was doing a capabilities brief to him, talking to him about what we were doing and what we were trying to, to achieve. Uh, and, I, and I explained it to him. Uh, and what struck me uh, with what we told him is how much interest he was, not necessarily in the capabilities that I was explaining to him, but more about the young soldiers, the men and the women who we were sending over here uh, and the concerns that he had for them uh, and also the concerns uh, for their families who would be left behind when they were, they were sent over here. And it was a genuine concern. It was a real compassion. But the conversation was far more than that because he had a real concern about the people of Northern Ireland, uh, both communities, all corners, every faction, uh, and he expressed a real desire that we had peace uh, in Northern Ireland uh, and that we could live uh, in peace uh, together. And it was absolutely uh, genuine, and it was a sense of the man who I was speaking to. Um, the second time I met him was about six years later, um, uh, and it was the Royal Military Academy uh, at Sandhurst. Um, I was a colour sergeant then. I was an instructor at the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. It was slightly more informal. It was a bit of a meet and a greet, a grip and grin session. And he walked around and, and met people. And we all uh, had a conversation with him. And he came to our table. And I remember the conversation we had, because we had a conversation about this tie. Yes, this tie is that old. It's as old as you, Johnny Buckley. And he asked me, what regiment is that? And we had a conversation about my tie, because it's not a regimental tie, it's an instructor's tie. And you get given that having completed um, your, your, your selection course to be an instructor at Santa. So we had a conversation about that. It's the only thing from that time that still fits me, by the way. Um, <laughs> we then talked about the knot in my tie. And for those who don't know this, that if you're not an officer, you're not allowed to have a Windsor knot in your tie. You have to have a different knot. I don't know what it's called, but you're not allowed a Windsor knot. And I remember saying to him, yeah, he says, what sort of knot's that? I said, well, it's not a Windsor knot. We're not allowed it. And he says, well, that's ridiculous in colourful language. <laughs> it's a Windsor knot now, by the way. <laughs> so 
So the point that I'm making is this, is that sometimes we forget about the man. Sometimes we look at the position. Sometimes we look at the privilege. And don't just focus on the person who is standing in front of you, who gave so much of his time, who helped and supported over 800 different charities. He was one of the World War II generation. And we have to remember that. So in those wee quips that I've given, and they are quips, and they're just small things speaking to a man, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, a husband. But it just gave you a sense of the person. And while I remember Her Majesty the Queen has lost her husband and a family have lost their father and grandfather, um, today I just remember him for who he was, a person who showed real compassion, a person who showed real understanding, a person who showed real empathy and wanted to do the best he could for everybody, particularly here in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I, I just want to, to add a, a few words to uh, the tributes that have been paid today. First and foremost, um, the uh, tribute to uh, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh uh, for the public service which he has given to our nation, but not only to our nation, but to many countries around the world. But I also want to uh, say today how um, this is also a personal loss, a personal loss of a husband, a father, a grandfather, and indeed a great-grandfather. His Royal Highness had a long and extremely eventful life, a tempestuous beginning, as those have made reference to, uh, just after the First World War, escaping and finding his way to London uh, through the turmoil of his family at that time, to marry a princess in 1947. And since that time, and since becoming consort to Her Majesty the Queen, providing steadfast support to her, always at her side. But there are many things, and it's important that we also share uh, some of the anecdotes and um, some of the achievements of this incredible life. Well remembered for his contribution to the Worldwide Fund for Nature, his very early contribution to the National Playing Fields Association, an organization which uh, brought me, in part at least, into some community life in my own community. Through the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, and I spent some 30 years in the Boys' Brigade as a leader and helping young men and others to achieve those uh, Duke of Edinburgh awards at bronze, silver, and gold level. I remember the first time that I saw the Duke of Edinburgh it was a very wet day, and as an 11-year-old schoolboy, I stood in Carrickfergus when the Queen and Prince Philip arrived uh, into the harbour there. I don't think there's been a wetter day since in Northern Ireland than that day, but it sticks out in my mind. But I can fast forward also, Mr Speaker, uh, to 2016, and I had the incredible privilege to be invited to Buckingham Palace to attend a reception to mark 50 years of the... Um, Fellowship of Winston Churchill Fellows. Her Majesty the Queen entertained some 100 of us in the palace that evening, and there were members of the royal family present. And in the lineup, of course, was Her Majesty the Queen, and by her side was Prince Philip. But as the evening progressed, people broke up into small groups, and of course, those of us from Northern Ireland tended to stand together. And individual members of the royal family who were present came round the various groups and chatted to us. But I think the thing that struck me was his interest and his knowledge about everybody who was in that room that night. He was engaging. He reminisced with us about Winston Churchill, which of course was fascinating. But he also was very inquisitive about what we had done and the contribution that we had made through our Churchill fellowships. So for me, uh, that evening of the 18th of March 2016 will stay with me for a very long time indeed. 
On behalf, Mr. Speaker, of my constituents in East Antrim, I wish to express my deepest condolences to the royal family, uh, to Her Majesty the Queen, and to the wider family circle at this particular time. As we uh, have engaged in a week of mourning, and as we progress towards a funeral which will take place uh, this weekend coming. So, Mr Speaker, on behalf of the Alliance Party and on behalf of the constituents that I represent in East Antrim, I wish to add my condolences uh, to uh, the Royal Family. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Diane Dodds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, uh, personally, on behalf of my constituents in Upper Ban, and in common with the sentiments expressed in this chamber, uh, I want to reiterate that our first thoughts and prayers are with Her Majesty the Queen, who after 73 years of marriage has lost her strength and stay of all these years. Surely the void she spoke about must be great and deep. In extending our sympathy to the Queen, the royal family, we are conscious that this is the passing of a much-loved husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, as well, of course, a statesman and a towering national figure. Most people alive have grown up with the reassuring presence of Prince Philip by the side of the Queen. He has been part of our lives as well as part of the nation. He will be greatly missed as someone who, while totally loyal to the Queen and a pillar of the royal family in the United Kingdom, was not afraid to be himself, to break the mould. As uh, many have expressed uh, in this chamber today, his humour and bluntness were legendary. But as Her Majesty said herself, she and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. He leaves behind a tremendous legacy in his own right. His distinguished service in the Royal Navy meant his sacrifice to be at the Queen's side when duty called was all the greater. His creation of the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme has helped millions of young people over many years. He was quite rightly proud of the fact that Northern Ireland has one of the highest number of participants per head of population in the scheme uh, compared with the rest of the United Kingdom. As an early pioneer and visionary in the world of conservation and the environment, he helped found the World Wildlife Fund in 1961, leading it as president from 1981 to 1996. Prince Philip's frequent visits to Northern Ireland earned him the respect and affection of people here, and he will always have a special place in our hearts. I recall particularly the visit to the grounds of Stormont for the celebration of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee in 2012, when tens of thousands of people were able to gather to show their admiration. As Her Majesty, his close family, and the people of the United Kingdom face into the future without his familiar presence. We know that at the time of sorrow, God will give grace, courage, and strength. Thank you. Can we please bring Sinead McLaughlin on screen? Can I invite Sinead McLaughlin to make her remarks? Can I invite Sinead McLaughlin to make her remarks, please? Can you hear me? Yes, proceed, please. Yep. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I wish to add my condolences on the death of Prince Philip. His engagement with young people right across our communities provides an example to our society which should be recognised, especially at this dangerous moment. Despite losing his own uncle to an IRA bomb, he continued his visits here on many occasions in the spirit of friendship and reconciliation, and it culminated in the successful state visit by the Queen, accompanied by her husband, in 2010. 
That is the spirit of reconciliation that all in the assembly and all in our society can recognize as being of enormous value as we continue to emerge from the dark shadow of our past. It is a past that seems we have yet to escape from. People not only from the union's tradition, but right across much of our society are in mourning for Prince Philip's death. Across this island, in the south as well as in the north, people have paused to consider the life of Prince Philip in this historical context and how much has changed in our society in, 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 during his lifetime and indeed in ours. Prince Philip has had a full and controversial life, but not always a happy one. And we remember him as a fellow human being, a man who was greatly loved and who we mourn together. We are all mortal. We have a shared experience of life and death. So as the poet John Donne has said, has said, send not to ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And despite our differences, we offer respect and thoughts together today because we are one society, whatever our differences. We can come together in sadness, in dignity, and also in hope. The hope that we have embodied in the Good Friday Agreement and that we need to reflect on at this dangerous time. The Queen and Prince Philip helped to solidify the peace achieved in the Good Friday Agreement. We'll just give it a few seconds before we may have to move on. I'm going to move on and uh, call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today is really the end of an era in the passing of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, a lifetime in which so much has happened, so much has changed. However, it is with Her Majesty the Queen, who has lost her husband of 73 years, and her family, that our thoughts and prayers are with at this very sad and difficult time for them. Prince Philip dedicated his extraordinary life to selfless, selflessly supporting the Queen, who in turn affectionately described him as her bedrock. Over the weekend, we learned so much about Prince Philip as a dear papa, a role that we so rarely heard about, a father who was always available to sit down and listen to the woes of his family, always around to offer support and guidance, not only to his children, but also to their partners. However, it is through the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme that he will be forever remembered. The encouragement he gave to young people in building resilience and increasing their confidence through this scheme it is through this scheme as an assessor that I had the pleasure of meeting him several times. The Duke I found to be very jovial, always showing a great interest in my work and always keen to learn of the experiences of the young participants in the award. He visited Hillsborough from the foundation of the award in 1956 and every year since until 2017 to present the Gold Awards. So while we celebrate an incredible life of dedication and devotion to his family, the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth, on behalf of my constituents in Fermanagh and South Tyrone, I wish to extend their sympathy and condolences to Her Majesty the Queen and her family. Thank you. I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I start uh, where the previous speaker ended, and passing on particularly the condolences and sympathies of my constituents in Strangford and my own to Her Majesty the Queen and the Royal Family on the sad loss. We meet rightly today to pay tribute to a great man, someone who throughout his 99 years was not simply someone who talked the talk, but was prepared to, to walk the walk. There will be some not in the chamber today who will be keen to lecture the rest of us 
on fascism, for example, but do little of practical benefit otherwise. We should remember that the Duke of Edinburgh was someone who, in his, uh, in his early life before he married the Queen, who actually was on the front line of fighting fascism directly in the, the Second World War. He was somebody who truly walked the walk. I had the opportunity and the great privilege of meeting him in 2002 when he came to meet Assembly members in two, uh, in, at Stormont. On that occasion, amongst countless others, over a period of seven decades, he was there to give support to his wife, the Queen. And today, therefore, we see a void in the life of the nation, but particularly a void in the life of the royal family, and particularly the Queen. And to lose her rock after 73 years, our hearts must go out to the Queen, and indeed Prince Philip's children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. But he's not simply just left a void, he has also left a lasting legacy. Mention has been made of his contribution in terms of the environment, in terms of industry, in terms of technology, in terms of wildlife. But it will be most keenly felt with the contribution he made to our young people through the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, now 65 years old. It's four elements of volunteering, of physical contribution, of skills and of expedition. Uh, or, indeed, as the Duke of Edinburgh himself put it in, I suppose typical wit and bluntness, a, a do-it-yourself growing up kit has touched the lives of so many throughout the generations. Five years ago, I, I was privileged to go along to an event um, in Ballyclare High School, which celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme. Throughout the two hours of that ceremony, with the Duke being represented uh, by the Earl of Wessex, uh, was a small snapshot of the contribution that the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme was doing. But that was a snapshot of a single year. Multiply that by the generations who have done it. Multiply the fact that this was simply the region of Northern Ireland. Multiply it throughout the whole of the United Kingdom. And indeed, multiply it throughout the world, where 130 countries have been involved with that. Within Northern Ireland alone, in the last full year, over 3,000 um, received awards. Over 6,000 uh, were actually had started a, a course. And over the last seven years, around about 16,000 have received awards in Northern Ireland. Throughout the UK, that figure is 6.7 million, and it spreads many more across the world. There is, I suppose, in conclusion, a saying in some parts of the world that you are never truly dead until the lives of all those you have touched have also died. With the lasting legacy, the ongoing legacy of the Duke of Edinburgh, particularly amongst our young people, the Duke of Edinburgh will be with us for many, many decades to come. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Meg Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I had the pleasure, and, and I do mean pleasure, of meeting at the Duke of Edinburgh on a small number of occasions. And the first uh, was a memorable day for me. I had been asked to be the presenter of Duke of Edinburgh Gold Awards at uh, St. James's Palace in London. And, and the role was to try and keep the young people amused until he arrived, then to stand back with a couple of other people while he engaged with them, then he'd speak to us, then he would leave, and then I handed out the certificates. From the moment he entered the room, he had those young people in the palm of his hand, smiles and giggles, and towards the end, a great roar of laughter as he was clearly sharing one of his racier stories with them. And then he came over to us. The first person he was introduced to was a teacher who, from memory, was in his 29th year of encouraging pupils to undertake the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. And the Duke was totally animated and engaged. And he wanted to know everything. Was he still in touch with the pupils? Had it helped them develop their character? Had it helped them in their careers? And then he turned to the second person who was introduced as a businessman. And the businessman, I'm afraid, made the schoolboy error of trotting out a pre-rehearsed speech, eulogizing the Duke of Edinburgh and the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. And as we've heard constantly since Friday, that was the last thing that Prince Philip wanted to hear. So suddenly he started pointing at this man's lapel and saying, well, in that case, where is it then? Where is it? And the poor fellow had to say, I'm sorry, sir, where's what? 
And he said, your badge. Where's your Duke of Edinburgh badge? The poor fella hadn't even done the bronze award. <laughs> so that was him blown out of the water. And then he turned to me and somebody introduced me. And he said, ah, you're the broadcaster. And I had to say, well, I, I was, sir. He said, oh, really? Well, w what are you doing with yourself now? And I said, well, I'm into politics, sir. And time stopped. And he was looking at me with a twinkle in his eye. And he looked at me from my head down to my feet and back up again. And he took a breath and he shook his head. He let out a sigh and he left the room. <laughs> it was pure theater. He roasted me. But Mr. Speaker, in those few short minutes, I saw so much to the character of the Prince. His dedication to duty, his determination to help young people fulfill their potential, his utter intolerance and refusal to accept flattery, and his wicked, wicked sense of humour. Uh, on behalf of myself and the people I represent in the constituency of Stancred, I send my condolences to Her Majesty the Queen uh, and to the Royal Family. Thank you. And I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I rise to give thanks for the life of His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, and to tender my deepest and heartfelt sympathies and that of the people of Upper Barnum, whom I represent, to Her Majesty the Queen and the entire royal family. His Royal Highness was an incredible man in his own right, a life devoted to public service. Many words come to mind when people think of the contribution of Prince Philip. Strength, duty, free thinker, forthright, service, an incredible life, I think we can all agree. His early years are like something out of an award-winning film. Born on an island of Corfu, into a world of severe and life-threatening circumstances. From arriving in Britain via a British warship sent by his future wife's uh, uh, grandfather, King George V, in a crib made from an orange box, to a flourishing naval career, like many of his generation, he fought with duty and courage in the Second World War, in Britain's darkest hour, he was among those that participated in the Allied invasion of Sicily. For the Duke of Edinburgh, service came first. Service to his nation and its people. And most importantly for him, service to Her Majesty the Queen, spanning some 73 years. At the Queen's coronation in 1953, the Duke of Edinburgh swore to be Her Majesty's liege man of life and limb, a service paid in full. Perhaps Her Majesty herself, in her own words, quite sum up that life of service. He was quite simply being my strength and stay all these years, and I and his whole family and this and many other countries owe him a debt of gratitude greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. I can't begin to comprehend what Her Majesty the Queen and indeed the royal family are enjoying today. They, like all families, grieve, but they grieve in the full glare of the media today. It is very difficult to quantify the depths of devotion and servitude made by the Duke of Edinburgh for his country and Commonwealth in a life spanning over 99 years. He accompanied Her Majesty the Queen on all 251 of her overseas tours, and he reigns as the longest serving consort of British history. Prince Philip had a genuine interest in Northern Ireland affairs. And his association with these shores lasting 73 years, with his last first with Her Majesty taking place in 1949, Despite the difficulties of the tragic and barbaric death of his uncle and mentor, Lord Louis Mountbatten, how difficult that must have been, but he was never afraid to reach the hand of peace across the divide. 
Through his distinctive presence and unique sense of humour, he put ordinary people at at ease, engaging in all that would encounter. On this Friday past, Mr Speaker, in closing, this nation lost a giant. As with any death, his passing will leave a huge void with his family, friends and loved ones whose lives were touched by his presence. And in time, we will be able to celebrate and fully understand the legacy that he has left and rededicate ourselves to those values which he devoted his extraordinary life. I know Her Majesty the Queen will take great comfort in Scripture. And I particularly draw comfort from those words in Matthew 23. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Alan Chambers. Mr Speaker, and could I add my thanks to you for facilitating uh, this tribute today. There's nothing much uh, to add, Mr Speaker, to the heartfelt and the touching tributes that have been made to the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, in this House today. He was a faithful and a loyal royal consort, a husband, a father, a grandfather, and a war hero. He never tried to overshadow the Queen, but he nevertheless used his position to do so much for the nation and the Commonwealth, and in particular to generations of our young people. My personal sympathy, Mr Speaker, and all those I represent in North Down go out to our grieving Queen and our family at this sad time. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, sir, first I want to commence by offering my heartfelt condolences to Her Majesty the Queen, the Prince of Wales, and the entire royal family on what must be an immense personal loss for them. I hope that they can take some comfort in knowing that their mourning is shared by millions of people across this country, billions across the Commonwealth and the globe. Seneca the Elder said that life, if well lived, is long enough. Nobody can be in any doubt that not only was the life of the Duke of Edinburgh long, it was a life well lived with a vast range of accomplishments in so many fields. After a difficult and often traumatic childhood, His Royal Highness spent his entire life in the devoted service of this country. During World War II, he served with distinction in the Mediterranean and the Pacific fleets. He was present for the surrender of the Japanese Empire, and he was mentioned in dispatches for service at Cape Matapan. He married the Queen in 1947, and subsequently he gave her 73 years of absolute loyalty, support, devotion and love. A tireless campaigner for conservation and environmental causes, in this he truly was a visionary and years ahead of the rest of society. It has already been mentioned that a lasting legacy which the Duke of Edinburgh leaves is the award scheme which bears his name. I participated in that scheme and actually, like the member from North Down, I got my bronze, I got my silver, but alas, I wasn't able to finish the the gold element of the scheme. But the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme is a magnificent legacy that he will leave. Prince Philip was of the greatest generation in this country's history, the generation that defeated Hitlerism and fascism. And I believe firmly that he would have succeeded in any walk of life. He more than succeeded in the path that he decided to walk in this life. He has gone to his reward. Matthew 25, verse 21 says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. God bless those who mourn. God save the Queen. And I call Roy Beggs. On behalf of my constituents of East Antrim, I too offer heartfelt condolences and sympathy to Queen Elizabeth II and the royal family following the passing of His Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. The royal family are in our thoughts and prayers at this time. 
The United Kingdom and the Commonwealth, and indeed the world, mourn the passing of the longest serving royal consort. The supporting husband to Her Majesty for a remarkable 73 years, her strength and stay. His life has been one of public service, firstly as a gallant uh, Royal Naval officer, uh, actively servicing, serving during World War II, and then his new role in selflessly supporting Her Majesty the Queen. He also became pat patron, to, patron to many charities, including the World Wildlife Fund, which he served for over 50 years, including periods of time as an active president. His has been a life well lived. From a personal perspective, as a serving Boys Brigade officer, I can vouch for the value of the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme. As a parent, I saw how it benefit my own three children. The Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme has positively helped shape the lives of tens of thousands of young people locally and indeed throughout the Commonwealth. Young people are required to volunteer in their, own, in their own community to help others. It's a great thing to instill that sense of caring in a young age. They're required to learn a new skill and they're required to undertake an expedition. I remember meeting an exhausted group of Relu, BB and GB members who were wet, tired, weary. They had walked for some three days carrying their tents and their food uh, on a trek from Ballycastle to Brucheen cross country. But what struck me was their determination and their effort that had been successful and their sense of achievement of having made that trek, something which they probably thought they couldn't really do. Uh, in this day and age, few young people uh, get to face such challenges, but it is a great achievement when they train and when they, they are successful. The Duke of Edinburgh Awards Scheme equips our young people with new skills, increased confidence, resilience, and enables them to make the most out of their lives. It is the young people who ben have benefited from the Duke of Edinburgh Awards Scheme that will be his greatest le legacy. The Queen has rightly insisted that the COVID regulations should be followed, and I would urge anyone who wishes to send a message of sympathy to pay tribute uh, to take some time out and visit the Royal website and sign that online Book of Condolences. He will be remembered uh, for the very supportive and selfless role that he played in supporting Her Majesty the Queen and how he had particularly benefited young people in our community. Thank you. And I call Gary Middleton. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And on behalf of my constituents in Londonderry and the wider Foyle constituency, I want to pass on my deepest sympathies and condolences uh, to Her Majesty the Queen on the very sad passing of His Royal Highness uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. It has been 68 years since Her Majesty and His Royal Highness stood in Guildhall Square in Londonderry. Uh, it was part of a visit following uh, the coronation. Uh, over the weekend, I heard uh, from many uh, constituents who had commented on posts um, saying of, of the fond memories that they've had from that visit, being there with their own parents and their grandparents, uh, and some of the uh, amazing me memories that they cherish. Uh, over the many decades that have followed since that visit, of course, the uh, Duke has um, served with immense dedication and a tireless commitment to his public service. That has been ev evident to us all here, not just in the United Kingdom, but across the Commonwealth and, the worldwide, and worldwide as well. His Royal Highness took part in over 22,000 solo engagements. When he retired in 2017, he was said to have been a patron, president, or a member of almost 800 organizations. He visited 143 countries in an official capacity. That is a significant lifetime of service. One of the many lasting legacies, of course, is that of the Duke of, Duke of Edinburgh Award. I, like many others, have benefited from that award and uh, I've been inspired listening to the many stories uh, right across 
uh, the UK and indeed worldwide of, of young people who have had their lives transformed through that particular award. And I, I trust that that will be a very much a, a positive, lasting legacy of His Royal Highness. In the 99 years of his life, uh, Prince Philip has seen many world-changing events. He's seen leaders uh, come and go, but his service went on. The impact of his service and his legacy will live on for many, many years to come. Of course, when it's all stripped back, Prince Philip was a devoted father, a grandfather, a husband, and of course a great-grandfather as well. Her Majesty the Queen, when speaking of her husband, stated that he was quite simply he has quite simply been my strength and stay in all these years. I very much have Her Majesty, the Queen, in my thoughts and prayers as she continues to reign over us in the times ahead. We have lost a tremendous public servant who for decades served his Queen and country. My heartfelt condolences to Her Majesty and the Royal Family. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call William Humphrey. Mr Speaker, and I rise on behalf of my constituents in North Belfast and his chair, of the Northern Ireland Assembly branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association to extend deepest sympathy to Her Majesty the Queen and offer condolences to her and her family on the sad passing of the Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark was born on the 10th of June 1921, evacuated of his family at the age of 18 months in an orange box from Corfu. He became a distinguished naval officer and a war hero in the fight against the evil of Nazis in World War II. Indeed, I had two uncles who served with him on HMS Ramillies, and I remember them fondly telling me of stories when he was on board. He married Prince Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth in November 1947 and became consort to the Queen, a role he carried out with distinction and an exemplary manner for some 73 years. <clears throat> he was, of course, a keen sportsman, and Prince Philip was president and patron of some 780 organisations until his retirement from public life and royal service in August 2017. The Duke completed some 22,000 uh, royal duties and delivered nearly 5,500 speeches. Passionate about world conservation, Prince Philip was president of the WWF from 1981 until 1996, but undoubtedly one of the Duke's most lasting legacies will be that, and indeed there will be many of them, will be that of the establishment of the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme some 65 years ago. As a lifelong scout, I commend the vision, foresight and immense leadership of that programme. In our United Kingdom alone, some 6.7 million young people have benefited from the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, and today I proudly wear my Duke of Edinburgh Diamond Challenge Award presented to me by the Earl of Wessex. Prince Philip was a much-loved and respected figure, not just at home, but across the world and throughout Her Majesty's Commonwealth. A real character with a sharp wit and intellect, I was privileged to meet him on a number of occasions while serving as High Sheriff and Deputy Lord Mayor of this great city. It was always a pleasure. The outpouring of grief and affection since Prince Philip's passing on Friday across the United Kingdom and the world demonstrates the love and respect the British people had for Philip. Indeed, I saw that yesterday when I and other members of my family laid flowers at Hillsborough, and a stream of people came along to do just that. We live in very difficult days, very difficult days for our country. He gave leadership. He showed us how to behave in public life. He did so for such a long time. He has left a legacy which will never and should never be forgotten. We mourn today, we respect the, the traditions that the House of Windsor has set out, but remember there's a family mourning. And today I would like to say that the hope and wish and pray that the presence of God will surround the royal family this time, and in the days ahead that God will save the Queen. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to pay tribute to Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, who has died aged 99, having given quite literally a lifetime of service to his country and to the wider Commonwealth. One of the saddest things when it comes to someone passing away is that it is only then, when they have gone, 
that do we offer the deserved words of celebration and recognition of a life well lived. Only then do we set the record straight with a narrative which is much more reflective of that, of that actual person and not the headlines written about them. That is why, Mr Speaker, that over the last few days it has been an absolute joy to hear from those who actually knew him best as to exactly what type of man the Duke was. A man who achieved more in one lifetime than most of us ever will. A war hero, a pilot, a naval commander, a top-class sportsman, a pioneering champion of wildlife and nature, an author, a philosopher. A man who, despite seemingly having no barriers to what he might achieve in his own chosen career, made a choice to step back and instead devote his entire life to serving Queen and country, knowing full well all that that would entail for his own ambition and his own complicated family history. It was fascinating to learn that this seasoned war hero was also the first to offer support to the younger generations who would follow him into a royal life of service. And he was the first to provide comfort to William and Harry on the death of their mother, Diana. Remarkably, shortly after the assassination of President Kennedy, it was Prince Philip who was found on the floor of the White House playing with the slain president's infant son who had become upset because he had no one to play with anymore. These are wonderful qualities and show that at the heart this was in private a man who cared deeply for those around him, even if sometimes his public manner suggested otherwise. His ability to care for younger generations were no doubt the driving force behind the incredible scheme which bears his name and which has changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of young people. Perhaps in his passing, the Duke of Edinburgh offers a final lesson to uh, those of us who serve in public office, that there's no greater privilege than to serve, and that he has provided the template and set the standard for all those who would do likewise. And as he might have pointed out with a little more directness than I, we might learn not to wait until we're all 99 years of age before being able to speak some kinder words about each other. Mr Speaker, my thoughts and prayers today are with the Queen and with the Royal Family as they mourn their great personal loss. Thank you, and I call George Robinson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, last Friday we learned of the death of His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. It is <clears throat> firstly correct that our sincere sympathies and condolences are extended to Your Majesty the Queen who has lost her much-loved husband of 73 years, who was her pillar of support and ever-dependable advisor for all those years, as the Queen has carried out duties here and throughout the world. Prince Philip's children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren are now left without the role model they all looked up to and sought wise advice from. They are all in our thoughts and prayers at this most difficult of times for all the family. We cannot ever underestimate the lasting positive impact on young lives Prince Philip had during his long and fulfilling life and indeed will still have for generations to come. This is true not just in the United Kingdom but on a global scale. This is a hard-earned but thoroughly justified way for the Prince's long life to be remembered. Generations of young people will continue to be helped thanks to the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, including many here in Northern Ireland. Mr Speaker, the Prince was always a great supporter of the armed forces who he served with during the, the World War II and beyond, and he was among the last of the war veterans who deserves the greatest respect for his service. The Prince was a man of great intellect, and in the days since his death, we have heard of his deep interest and influence in engineering sport, ecology and theology. All of us today can learn a lesson from the Prince's life to public service. We all will mourn with his family. Theirs endures tremendous, tremendous loss. And again, Mr Speaker, on behalf of myself and East Londonderry constituents, we offer our sincere condolences and sympathies to the Queen and family on the death of the Duke. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, and I call Tom Buchanan. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and like others around the chamber, first of all, uh, today I want to, on behalf of the constituents of West Tyrone, uh, tender our sincere sympathy to the Queen and to the Royal Family Household at this time. Friday, 9th of April, 2021, will be a date that's etched in all of our memories as the news filtered through of the death of a great man who was loved by so many, His Royal Highness Prince Philip. It's one of those occasions in life when we will remember where we were, what we were doing, who we were with, whenever the news uh, broke. And though a man a few weeks short of his 100th birthday, we never really expected the suddenness of his death due to uh, such an active life that this man lived. Prince Philip, as others have said, was not only a dedicated husband of 73 years, but also a dedicated father, grandfather, and a great-grandfather. And yet, despite all of these responsibilities, we see how he gave himself to a full life of service to country and the Commonwealth. Someone who was forthright, intelligent, and forward-thinking, serving as patron to some 800 organizations, and leaving the most lasting legacy through the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, which so many of, you, of our young people and I suppose those who are older today who have passed through it over the past 55 years can testify how they have benefited from it. Throughout his life, Prince Philip exemplified the qualities of duty, service and sacrifice to both country and commonwealth with great humour, humility and indeed humanity and has no doubt left us all a great example to follow. I remember the day that my colleague Edwin Putz made reference to when the Queen and Prince Philip came to the South West uh, to open the new uh, acute hospital there in Enniskillen, and what humour was there that day presented by uh, Prince Philip. And just as I was reflecting on those things this morning, I remembered the words of Jonathan to David in 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 18. David was taking his leave from the king's table. And Jonathan came to him, and Jonathan said unto him, Thou shalt be missed, for thy seat will be empty. And I think as we reflect today on the loss of Prince Philip, and as we extend our sincere Christian sympathy to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and the entire royal household, we think of a chair that is now empty. We think of a voice that is now silent. We think of words of wisdom that are no longer there. And today we sincerely pray that the royal household and Queen Elizabeth will all know the strength, the comfort, and the blessing of God in the days, in the weeks, and the months to come. Thank you. Members, that concludes tributes to the late Prince Philip. Item 4 on the order paper is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you.